regreso aquí en Auto 060 en la edición especial sobre el resumen de lo que ha sucedido en el 2013, las presentaciones, los debuts, los cambios. Así que vamos a un tercer segmento con Carl Bauer, que es el Bluebook.com, talking about the best cars of 2013. So here we're back with Carl. Uh, Carl, we're like getting uh, uh, to the end of 2013, and uh, we actually... Uh, share a couple of drive events. I remember the Kia Soul was one of them and I think we did the Santa Fe too, the Hyundai Santa Fe earlier this year, or it was last year, I don't even remember. It's confusing now. They all blur together, don't they? Yeah, 2013, 2014, and we're seeing 2015 cars, so uh, let's see, uh, what's your opinion? What was uh, the best uh, car or the best uh, memory that you have for what you drove in 2013? I think the car that surprised me the most uh, in a good way was the Jaguar F-Type, and I know you've driven that too, uh, Javier. That car is amazing. I mean, it really it is a viable 911 alternative, and I don't say that lightly. I don't know if I've ever said that before. The 911 is such a fabulous car, and it has such a unique proposition in the market. And if someone would have told me three years ago that I would be calling a Jaguar product a viable 911 alternative for someone looking for that kind of vehicle, I wouldn't have believed them. So yeah, I'm very impressed, and I just think the car is fabulous. Yeah, and some people wouldn't still <laughs> believe you. I mean, like, because uh, obviously Porsche has a very loyal fan base. I mean, the, car are the cars are fabulous. But, yeah, I, I completely agree with you. I actually had the the, the opportunity to, dri to drive it uh, recently at the Jaguar Driving Performance Academy and the Homestead Miami Speedway. And that that's where you really can, can enjoy, like, all the power of the, the great handling and all that that the, the car has. And in general, I think uh, I, I agree with you that Jaguar this year probably started to, like, show exactly where they're going and, like, really, really improving from, uh, from just uh, not many years ago. Yeah, I mean, you think about it, and, you know, um, uh, Rattan Tata, who runs the huge uh, automotive manufacturing company in, in uh, India, took control of Land Rover and Jaguar, you know, several years ago from Ford. But, it, you know, as we know, in the car industry, nothing happens overnight. So he had to invest, and he had to start really, you know, bringing those brands back around. And I think we're just this year seeing the fruits of his labor, because the other impressive car for this past year was both the Range Rover, the full-size one, and the Range Rover Sport, the smaller one. Both of those vehicles, again, are just amazing, uh, not only in their leap forward from the previous versions, but just amazing SUVs. They're just amazing luxury SUVs. And I consider, I think, a Range Rover Sport. I mean, I drove one of those recently, and it was one of those rare days where it actually was inclement weather here in Los Angeles, raining like crazy, and I had to drive home. And I, I felt like king of the world, literally. I mean, the car was unstoppable. I didn't have a moment's hesitation on what the car was going to do for me in that in that weather situation. And, of course, I've off-roaded both of them to the extreme. I just think they're fabulous cars, again. And this is just proof that Tata has invested in those two brands, and we're just seeing really the first totally new products that are coming to market since he took over. And if this is an indication of what's to come, I think you're going to see a lot more awards and a lot higher visibility and a lot better sales for the Jaguar and Land Rover products. Yeah, speaking about sales, the Range Rover Sport is on a one-year waiting list. I mean, who would have thought, like, uh, just like a few years ago, that they would have that quote unquote problem, which I, I actually I think it's, it's, it's getting to be a kind of a serious problem, even though they're running the factories 24 7 over in England. I mean, uh, a year is a lot, especially considering as we are talking how many products is uh, out there, how many new cars are there. So if you buy, if you commit to a car now and wait a year, in a year, there's going to be something really cool probably out there, including a, a probably a new crossover Jower. Yeah, yeah, no, the saw industry is changing on a, almost like a weekly, daily basis, so any, uh, committing to a product, uh, a purchase a year out, uh, yeah, you're going to have to really have a commitment to not uh, to not waver uh, when, you, when you have a typical year go by these days and all the new stuff that's introduced that's, that's you know, bigger and brighter and better than the previous year. Um, but I, I know, I, I remember when I drove the Sport on the first press event, and I was like, you know, probably not able to afford one anyways, but I remember thinking to myself, boy, if 
I wanted one of these, I'd have to like get on the list now. And the guys were kind of back then. They were saying, "Oh, if you want, if you were at all serious about thinking of wanting one for yourself, tell us now because there's already a three to four month waiting list." And that was in like August. So yeah. Now it's at a year. A year, and they have a waiting list for the cancellation of the waiting list. <laughs> so if someone cancels, you get a call from the dealership like, "Well, that's a new one." And actually, uh, it's it's uh, what I, when I'm saying it's getting to be a problem. I actually have a friend who ordered one. Hers was coming in March. They uh, called her a few weeks ago telling her that well, there was a cancellation and the particular model that was canceled on that waiting list was a little bit more expensive than the one she had ordered. But uh, she agreed to that over the phone when they called her and then when she got to the dealership, they told her, okay, that's fine, but then you're going to have uh, to pay an, an extra $5,000 premium on top of it. And then, like, they lost her. because uh, oh. that, And that's where the problem comes because, I mean, having high demand for your vehicles is great, but if you're in the consumer experience, it's not that a good problem anymore. Yeah, well, and I always, I always feel frustrated almost. I always kind of feel bad for the manufacturers because at the end of the day, there's the manufacturers and there's the dealers, and they operate fairly independently despite the fact that they're supposed to be partners. And it's always sad when you feel like a manufacturer is being kind of damaged or torpedoed by a bad dealer behavior, you know, and that's a good example where you had a fan of the brand and of the model who may never come back because of her dealer experience, which is unfortunate. Well, yeah, she went out and buy a Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Uh, the new one. So, I mean, a gain for Mercedes-Benz, a loss for Range Rover. But uh, speaking of the Mercedes-Benz class, that was another car that debuted this year that is just, like, fantastic. I mean, they Mercedes-Benz, Mercedes-Benz PR team calls it the best car in the world. And uh, I don't think they're that far away from that denomination. What do you, what do you think about it? Well, we just keep getting closer and closer to this driving yourself, you know, cars that drive themselves and don't need any human input. And I know that the S-Class is kind of at the head of that uh, of that uh, technology curve. And, yeah, it's just, you know, these guys know that, that premium brands are really under the gun because, you know, think about it, Javier. It used to be the difference between a premium brand and a non-premium brand was pretty substantial in the quality of the seat leather and the quietness of the, of the cabin at highway speed and all. Well, now all the non-premium cars have really quiet uh, interiors and they've got navigation systems, they've got supple leather seats available if you pay a little more. So the premium automakers just have to keep working harder and harder to differentiate themselves and the S-Class is the top of the Mercedes-Benz line. So they didn't mess around, they just created a car that was just a whole other level up again on the technology and on the luxury and the safety. It's uh, it's amazing car. Yeah, and speaking of Mercedes again, like they also another car on the other extreme of their lineup, uh, the CLA came out this year and they like doing great with that car. I mean, maybe maybe not as bad as the Range Rover Sport uh, uh, waiting list, but like they're selling the new CLA, which starts officially on their $30,000. Uh, they're having great success with that car. Uh, I also love that car. What, what, what do you think about that one? No, I think it was a brilliant move for them. They know that if they could put a, an official MSRP where the first number is a two and not a three, that's going to draw people in. And once they're in there, you know, Kelly, we're tracking the transaction prices, and the cars are averaging at like 37000 So, you know, they're getting enough people who want to come in and see the car to buy them, and they're not even trying to get them in the lower price versions. They're just going ahead, right ahead and paying the money to get a really nicely equipped one. So they're kind of losing the whole low-priced entry-level thing in the process, but that's getting them interested in in the door, which is exactly what Mercedes wanted, and it's working perfectly. Um, you wonder how thin they can slice that onion, because they do have the C-Class, which I believe we're going to see the next version of in Detroit next month, but uh, you know, you got to think that the CLA is going to start intruding on the C-Class, which was their previous you know, entry-level car. It's going to have to start cannibalizing those sales somewhat. Yeah, and uh, we're going to analyze in the next segment, because <laughs> we were talking about the next segment, we're going to talk about what we're going to see in the Detroit Auto Show, and expe- uh, we're going to see the new C-Class. So we'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Mercedes-Benz is also announced during the LA Auto Show that they're coming up with the B-Class, electric at least uh, for now. So they're even getting lower and lower into the, not the, the quality, but the size. So and, uh, as uh, we know, a, a famous phrase from uh, the former uh, PR guy at Mercedes-Benz, uh, Jeff Day, he said, uh, it's easier to get uh, from the penthouse to the lobby than from the lobby to the penthouse. And that's apparently what Mercedes-Benz is doing, right? Yeah, no, you're right. They, they, they 
has the branding and the premium reputation, and so they know that if they just start making smaller, less expensive cars, they're going to pull in a lot of people who otherwise couldn't afford their vehicles up until this point. And, uh, of course, the electric thing just kind of keeps getting more and more noise, so it also opens them up uh, to kind of the green environmental-oriented uh, shoppers as well. So it's, again, a good move to have that all-electric B-Class coming to the U.S. Yeah, uh, um, we are having this great conversation. There are so many cars that we can talk about, and uh, we only have like one more minute in this segment. Uh, but Tesla kind of like made the, the big move this year, and like they're like not only like, making consumers happy, they're also creating a roar in the way they sell cars with a new uh, way of having uh, not dealerships, but like showrooms in uh, shopping centers. And, and so they're changing the whole industry, right? Yeah, and it's going to be a challenge because, uh, you know, I like to say that uh, you know, there's a few things you can't beat. That's death, taxes, and the uh, dealer dealer lobbying body in the U.S. And uh, so uh, we're going to see if, uh, if Tesla and, and Elon Musk can actually, you know, come up with a non-traditional purchase system because the dealers in this country have a lot of influence over uh, how they want everyone to have to follow the same franchise dealer laws. But uh, Elon wants to go a different route, wants to have more like, you know, like you said, Apple showrooms, so maybe they'll go that way. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see that, and I, I think it's starting to happen, so we'll see what, what, what goes on that. So, uh, again, um, Carl Bauer from KellyBlueBoo.com, and uh, when we come back for the final segment of this special edition of Auto Series 60 here in Christina Reed and Network, we're going to talk about what we're going to see at a Detroit Auto Show uh, in just a, a, a few days. So, um, we'll be back here with uh, Carl Bauer in uh, Auto Series 60.